Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. Welcome to another episode of Reality Asserts Itself. The role of finance in the world today is overpowering, overpowers politics, overpow overpowers the media, overpowers just about everything. And that's what this series of interviews is more or less going to be about. Is that something that's controllable? How could that be changed? And joining us is a man who's been on the inside and on the outside criticizing it is Rob Johnson, who now joins us in the studio. Thanks for joining us, Rob. My pleasure. So, Rob is the president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking and a senior fellow and director of the Global Finance Project for the Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Institute in New York. He recently served on the United Nations Commission of Experts on International Monetary Reform under the chairmanship of Joseph Stiglitz. In the past, he's had many different careers, one of which was he served as chief economist of the U.S. Senate Banking Committee. He was also senior economist of the U.S. Senate Budget Committee. Robert was also a managing director at Soros Fund Management, where he managed a global currency, bond, and equity portfolio specializing in emerging markets. He's also one of the men who broke the Bank of England. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Now, we're going to get back to the story of one of the men who broke the Bank of England, but as everybody knows, who watches reality asserts itself. We start with personal biographical story, and then we move on into some of the issues. And so that's what we're going to do now. So your story, Rob, starts in Detroit. Uh, a bit about the household you grew up in, what was the political atmosphere, and, and some of the early experiences that shaped the way you looked at the world and look at the world? True. My father was a physician uh, from a family in Chicago of physicians who had had uh, a role in inner city hospitals and he had a downtown practice, largely African-American employees and African-American patients. Uh, he was also a professor at uh, Wayne State University and uh, a jazz pianist, played semi-professionally and uh, was often at his funeral they said uh, he was a physician who did music on the side and that was probably a mistake. <laughs> now that's a, a quite a choice in Detroit to choose to have a mostly black clientele and black staff because well, like, like Baltimore where we are, Detroit's a, a rather apartheid city. Well in, in the downtown in the city proper the black people are the majority and uh, so in that respect it's not but it's a choice to, pra to practice there but the choice to practice there rather than in the suburbs or up in Pontiac or Troy or one of those places and it was a deliberate choice yeah what, what drove that choice well, I think his heritage his father's role during the depression as a physician in downtown or you know south side west side of Chicago uh, he, I think he was following in his father's footsteps in that regard hmm. my mother was a uh, choral singer who also worked with the development department of the uh, symphony in Detroit. She's originally from Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, she was educated as a dietitian at University of Michigan. But uh, she, uh, she had a very, what you might call, philanthropic sensibility. Both my parents were Republicans with a noblesse oblige kind of sensibility about uh, creating the space to be involved in community service. That's, that's actually interesting, a Republican. Now, the Republicans of th that day are quite different than the Republicans of this day. But even then, a Republican that chooses, chooses to work in downtown urban Detroit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wouldn't have been alone in that regard. As you said, the moderate Republicans were uh, uh, what I'll call a Gerald Ford Republican. Gerald Ford, also from Michigan, also a University of Michigan graduate. That was not unusual in, in Michigan at that time. So what starts to shape you as you, as you get a little older? Uh, yeah. You've told me the story before of your, of yeah. your paper route. Uh, I had a paper route that included uh, union leaders and automotive executives, people like Douglas Frazier, people like Leonard Woodcock. And uh, so when you're delivering paper in the morning, people want their paper early, they'll give you bacon and eggs uh, if you get the paper to them first. So I was hearing what you might call the war stories, the tales, the narratives, about the world, about the city of Detroit from this labor, management, independent entrepreneurs, manufacturers, representatives. They're all, get, they're all giving you bacon and eggs. Yeah, oh yeah, over time, over time. And uh, so I learned a great deal. I watched the turmoil of Detroit, the 67 riots, the Teamsters and Jimmy Hoffa, 
How, how old are you during the 67 riots? 67 riots, I was 10 years old. And, and what uh, kind of impact? What, what did you understand about why they were taking place? And I didn't understand a great deal other than I knew it was a black and white conflict. But I did hear gunshots at night sitting at home. I did see, and I lived in the suburbs, about two blocks out of the city limit, at what they called Alter Road, the Berlin Wall, according to the Wall Street Journal, which was the line between black and white between the 7th Precinct of Detroit and the suburbs. Uh, they had sandbags and tanks uh, all lined up. Uh, you could feel political tension. As a 10-year-old boy, I could feel political now, tension. At 10, I guess you didn't understand it, but for people that don't know what happened in, in that period, give us a bit of context. Well, Detroit was an experience of black people coming north, particularly after the uh, development of the cotton gin. Uh, Nicholas Lehman's book, The Promised Land, is a fabulous story of the migration north of African Americans. Uh, Henry Ford believed that black people could be very substantial productive part of his vision of society. Their places of worship he helped subsidize the formation of. He brought them to the north just like Eastern Europeans and others were brought to Detroit. Detroit was a real melting pot. They said at one point there were more places of worship per square mile in Detroit than any place in the world because all the different denominations were represented. And uh, Ford uh, had created this enthusiasm for everybody being part of society and the black people were invited just like everyone else. So what, what was 67 about? 67 was about the fact that they were there but there were lots of things particularly in how the police treated black people that were not, how we say, treating them with the same human regard as others. And so uh, those tensions had boiled over uh, there had been a group uh, called the Stress Force in Detroit that the mayor had brought uh, into the city, which were largely uh, what you might call kind of wired up people, that many former Green Berets, many who had come out of Vietnam, acting as Plain Co's vigilante policemen. And it, so, how would I say, they took, out, took things out more on the black people by far than anyone else. So, the notion of legitimacy and fairness of law enforcement was very much in question. But you had the UAW there, you had the Teamsters there, you had the racial tensions there. Detroit was a real cauldron at the same time as the auto industry was at that point what you might call the engine of the American and the world economy and, and, and centered and there too. It's a city, as I said, like Baltimore, which is, was, was and still to, to a large extent is quite segregated. Um, yes. How much is, as you're becoming a teenager do you become conscious of this kind of systemic racism? Well, it started when I was very little. Uh, when I was in junior high school, I was the quarterback on our uh, equivalent traveling Little League football team. And, you know, our team's all white guys, but lots of the teams in our league, are like at Highland Park and other places in Detroit, are black teams. And so you kind of, you, you know, you know the difference. You know that young black kids aren't treated right at your local community pool when they come as visitors. You know, my father had a number of black friends, other physicians and their children and so forth. When they'd be our guest, like going out sailing with my dad, you could feel the tension. People sort of saying, why are you bringing these people out to the boat docks? Uh, the way in which, I would say, law enforcement handled the, the boundaries between the white suburbs and the black or if a wealthy prosperous say black physician be a friend of my father's wants to buy a home in Bloomfield Hills or Gross Point the, the more affluent suburbs the way in which that didn't happen right. meaning through the brokerage community through discouragement this was it was profoundly there now you're when I was a boy in uh, junior high school I played basketball and my coach was on the high school team, and we really liked him, so I used to go to the high school games. We saw games ended because essentially fights broke out between the black and white players in some of these games and some of the fans that had to be stopped by the police. They just would stop. You know, what we were in was called the Border Cities League, and there were groups from farming communities, groups from urban black communities, groups from the white suburbs, 
and every now and then you'd hit a flashpoint, and it, you know, these were serious fights. I mean, this was right. big brawls. You also grew up at a time of the Vietnam War. Yes. What, how did this, you're growing up in a Republican household. How, what, how, what was the attitude of your family towards Vietnam War? I think my father, who had been in the United States Navy during the Korean War, had a certain romance about the military and service and obedience to authority, as many people did from the earlier gen world, Second World War, that earlier generation. The younger generation, of course, people who were my age or just primarily a little bit older than me, guys that I would play touch football with and the like, these people did not have any faith in the government. They'd had no sense of what this mission was. And uh, some of us experienced you know, loss of friends, loss of older brothers. More importantly, we'd have people come back to the community after serving, and you could see the emotional traumas, what now they call post-traumatic stress disorder. And, and the, the cost of that war was felt very much in the streets and in the community, and also disproportionately by the black community. In terms of your own belief in Americanism, uh, you know, as 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 you become a teenager and the, the, you're kind of getting close to draft age, around near the end of the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. uh, I think you told me before that you, your your number was called, but you weren't drafted. The draft was but over. Yeah, but they had a lottery, yeah. but they didn't invoke right. that year of the draft. They had ended it because by 1975. But just the in war terms of your own political development, your own outlook. Is this a good war? This is a just war? Do you believe the official narrative of, of you know, the, the support for the, the uh, need to In the fight beginning, I'm a little bit young. The encroachment of communism everywhere and all yeah, of this. You know, I mean, you, you, the, uh, when I'm nine or ten years old, I'm really not conscious of good or bad. I'm talking more as you get into your But as I get years. into my teen years, the idea that the government had done something that was illegitimate was more the tone of what the community felt. Obviously, in those days, the music scene. You know, Buffalo Springfield for what it's worth. Something happened in here. What it is, it ain't exactly clear. Neil Young's Four Dead in Ohio at the Kent State episode. We, we were not experiencing, which you might call, uh, a lot of cultural transmission in favor of the war. But your father was. And My father was. Does that put you at odds? In with the him? early 60s, loyal to the government. So by the early 70s, he thought the war was a mistake. Uh, he, he was not uh, dogmatic in that respect. I think he evolved, whereas younger people were more suspicious earlier. And, you know, most people grow up with a kind of faith in the official narrative that comes from school, often yeah. transmitted yeah. by parents and such, and then you get a little older, you start questioning the whole thing. Mm -hmm. When does that start have to happen for you? Oh, probably about 1970 or 71. I got to know a man named John Sinclair, who was a leader of a kind of alternative culture in the Detroit metropolitan area. He ran a, I loved music, and he ran a blues club called the Rainbow Room. When I was underage, he'd let me come in and see some of the great blues men, you know, the Muddy Waters and Willie Dixon, Lafayette Leak and others, and uh, his community, that vibe from that community was very much about music, very much uh, rebellion, questioning authority. Uh, and, and so the proximity to that cultural milieu, some of the bookstores I went to, record shops and so forth, was very much in the anti-Vietnam tradition. So around you, as you're, you're, you're old enough at 14, 15 to be aware, and, and there's a big protest against the Vietnam War mm -hmm. uh, around the world. There's a kind of a revolutionary the ROTC mood. buildings are being bombed in, at Ann Arbor. The SDS was founded, you know, Tom Hayden and the like in Ann Arbor, the Port Huron Statement. All these things are kind of percolating around you uh, as a young person at that time. I used to go up to Ann Arbor largely to watch the football games when Michigan played all state. But you go to the record stores, you get the pamphlets that people are handing out, you can see the the counterculture in Ann Arbor at that time, and uh, uh, and like I said, going down making rounds with my dad, sitting and talking to the women that were like the nurses and assistants and some of the patients in his office, uh, being around the music scene with my parents. There, there's a lot of rumbling going on, mm. and you'd, ha you'd have to have your ears completely closed not to hear some of Okay, uh, we're going to pick up the story in the next segment of our interview. So please join us for part two of our series of interviews with Rob Johnson on Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network.